there's a push to change the way we use Amber Alerts when we're looking for missing children. Some say there's a gap in the system. Also, are you looking for a new car? Now might be the time to buy because dealers say if it is passed, the governor's budget will not help you when it's time to get a new ride. Also, education advocates are here to talk about what's wrong with the way Connecticut does things now, things that they say end up costing us money, time, and sometimes chances to help kids succeed. I'm Lori Perez. You are watching The Real Story. Just a few days ago, Connecticut was in fear. Hundreds were helping in the search for a missing 13-year-old girl from Orange. She's thankfully been since been found. But as she was missing, state police refrained from issuing an Amber Alert because they did not suspect foul play. Right now, the state's Amber Alert system is activated for missing children under the age of 16. But State Senator Rob Kane wants that system to expand. Fox Connecticut's Jen Bernstein shows us why. The Amber Alert pull on a Blue Haven. When an Amber Alert goes out, the entire state is instantly notified. Billboards light up with the warning. An emergency message is put out to radio and TV stations. It's credited with helping numerous children. But State Senator Robert Kane says an expansion of Connecticut's system could help more, particularly with runaway children. Right now, the Amber Alert system is set up for children under the age of 16. And there are children who fall through the cracks. Senator Kane is proposing a bill that would make the state include runaways in the system. Connecticut was one of the earliest states to adopt the program in 2002. It's currently run by the state's Department of Public Safety. Amber Alert became a federal program in 2003. The premise is, is, is simple. We need to protect the lives of our children. We need to be more responsive when it comes uh, to times when they are missing. Even runaways, for example, that we spoke about uh, need to be protected. And here now to tell us more about this mission is Senator Rob Kane. Thanks for being here, Rob. Thank you for having me, Laura. Senator, if you could tell me, in, um, in the case of this little uh, girl missing from Orange, they did issue what was called a silver alert. And if you could tell me what that is and, and why you think that that is, uh, should be expanded. Well, I'm grateful that they did offer that silver alert because, as you know, that was the reason she was found, is the media attention, uh, getting the police and law enforcement involved, is how people were able to see her and, and, make, and notice her and, and bring attention to it. So a silver alert is, is, is like an amber alert? It is, but the, the misnomer is that it's only for people with uh, elderly who have dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, it does include children under the age of 15. We want to expand that. There should be a silver alert for missing persons. All missing persons are, are very important to us. They're very, uh, their lives are uh, so valuable. We need to step in right away because we know that first 24 hours is so important. Well, so what, I don't understand what the um, hesitancy is to do that. You know, there, there's the old, the old adage that, you know, the boy who cried wolf, and, and you'll lessen its effectiveness if you put them out too often. I, I disagree. I disagree. Uh, this case shows that by putting the media attention to this issue, people were out in droves looking for this child, and they did find her safe and sound. I mean, isn't that what we all want, is to find our loved ones safe and sound? So is there um, any sort of a cost associated with, with putting these out? Is that, no, that be some of the resistance? Or? I don't think so, because the police in, the, still have their their discretion in dealing with witnesses and dealing with family members as to see the severity of each situation. So they're still going to have that discretion. We're not taking that away. We just want to expand it so everyone's included. And so where does this bill stand now? The bill came out of the Public Safety Committee and it should move through the legislature, I'm hoping. We're looking for bipartisan support and I, I think it's a good bill and it should have bipartisan support. Well, I mean, and I think that this particular story with its um, successful ending and, and happy ending should, should help that, I would think. It should prove that it works. Right. And, and you know, even shows like yours, shows like this, that, that show that the attention we need to have on the subject. Right. So moving on to other issues, I know you've been very busy. I know that municipal leaders were at the Capitol this week um, giving their take on the budget, how it's going to affect local budgets, and, and what are you hearing from them? You know, I think they're happy that they're level funded, especially with the educational cost sharing, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not so happy in other areas like the uh, manufacturing pilot exemption that we offer to municipalities. Uh, my town alone, my hometown of Watertown, is going to lose close to five to $600,000 dollars in that manufacturing is exemption. So I think they're a, a little nervous because they're not going to be able to make it up in, in the so-called cabaret tax and hotel tax that yeah. the governor's proposing. Uh, it just won't happen. So what are you um, telling them about the possibility of, of you know, changes to the things that they don't like in the budget? 
Well, I think what we need to do first is reduce spending at the state level uh, and then give some mandate relief to the towns and the cities. Now, that's the biggest thing. Maybe fix the prevailing wage uh, issues that we have, yeah. binding arbitration. There's a whole host of things we can offer the towns to fix their, their, their conundrums that they're under. You know, we've had um, some other people come up on the show in recent weeks, and they're all talking about the need, Republicans in, in particular, are talking about the need to cut more. Um, is there anything specifically that you look at and say, boom, right there? That's an example of what we need to cut. The bureaucracy. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we have such a bloated bureaucracy. The, the government has just grown. Uh, uh, there was a stat today I saw that the judicial department grew by 38 percent in the last 10 years, when in fact the private sector has lost 100,000 jobs in the last year, year and a half. We can't continue to go down that road when we're not producing jobs in the economy to support those government services. So do you think that the cuts that he has made um, in, in the number of uh, managers at the state level are, is not sufficient? Uh, certainly. Yeah, I, I think the governor has done a great job. He's, he's certainly open and honest, uh, but I don't think he's gone far enough. No, not to my liking. I think we need to reduce the size of government a lot more. So how much resistance, and this is a question I've asked a few people, how much resistance do you think there will be? Because some people say, no, they're just going to all blame it on the governor and it'll go through, or um, some people say it's going to be a long, hot summer. The, the, the nice thing about the, the, this governor is he said that I am open, I have an open-door policy, I will listen to ideas. We're coming up with our ideas on our side of the aisle. We plan on proposing them to him. We hope he takes them under consideration because I think we have some good ones. So, for instance, when you mentioned uh, the manufacturing tax in your town, that particularly affects your town. I mean, is there a, an organized group who's going in to talk to the governor saying, hey, this is an example. I don't know. Perhaps you don't fully understand the gravity or you don't understand the effect or. Yeah, certainly, you know, CBIA had their business day last week. You're, there's other advocacy groups that are come up and, and testify today. We had a big public hearing on money files, the child, another issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are people testifying. I think the big thing is shows like this, uh, getting the court of public opinion to change. We need people to call their individual legislator, get involved, and tell them, no, I don't like these tax proposals. We need to reduce spending. Well, speaking of the court of public opinion, of course, the governor has been making his rounds around the state. Have you been to any of the town hall meetings? I haven't. He hasn't held one in my district. I was hoping he would. <laughs> what, do you, what do you make of them? Uh, you know, I, I give him a lot of credit. He's certainly listening to the people. He's, uh, he's out there 17, I think he, he, he's doing. Uh, so I do give him credit for that. Let's hope he takes that information because from what I hear, people are not happy at those forums. They're telling him to stop uh, increasing the taxes that he's proposing. I hope he goes, takes a second look at that and, and, and takes that into consideration and reduces the taxes that he's proposed. Right, absolutely. Well, you're doing a good job and we appreciate you for being here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Senator Rob Kane, thanks to him. Now, coming up next, if you drive a car, you're going to want to hear about this. Governor Malloy says he is looking for new sources of revenue to help close the budget gap. But car dealers say he should not be looking at them.